So hi everybody, this is Jill Hurston with Zip. Welcome to episode seven of Zip Chat. We're happy to have you join us today. So with that, I'd like to introduce our Zip Chat host, Mike Watson. He is the VP of Engineering at Zip. So Mike, I'm gonna just turn it over to you. Thanks, Jill. Uh, appreciate it. So yes, today our topic for Zip Chat episode seven is um, challenges in adopting serverless technology or serverless and AWS, however you want to look at that. I'm very excited about this topic. It's something that was introduced to me uh, maybe a year and a half ago um, at a conference where I got to see Ben Kehoe speak on this topic and how serverless is more than just you know an infrastructure play. It's, it's a mindset and how to build software. So um, anyway, so now 18 months later or so, here we are coming together. I've had the opportunity to work on a project with serverless with uh, some of the folks in this call, and uh, I'm excited to chat about it. And uh, with that, I'm going to jump right into it. But first, let me introduce uh, my panelists. Uh, Philip Edge, he's the VP of Engineering and CSO at Intertech Alchemy. We also Absolutely. have Matt Griffin. Uh, he's Hello. the Chief Architect at Intertech Alchemy. And then with from AWS, we have Gandhi Rec Ketla, Reketla, <laughs> sorry, Gandhi. Um, he's uh, he's a solutions architect at AWS and quite knowledgeable in AWS service offerings. So let's begin. Um, I'm going to start by asking uh, Gandhi a question here. Um, actually, let's start with a poll. How about we do that? So the poll topic is how far down the serverless rabbit hole is your organization? So here we're just trying to gauge, um, you know, who's who's got the experience, you know, how much experience you have, uh, which will help us down the road here. So take a few minutes to answer that. Mike, it looks like just about everyone has voted, so I'm going to close the poll and Perfect. show you the results. Perfect. All right, so let's look at these results. Um, so it looks like what I would expect. Everyone's dabbling in serverless. Uh, some people are all the way to fully bought in, which is awesome. And then, you know, somewhat a uh, small number of not using quite yet. Hopefully we can convince you that it's a way to go and maybe we can get more into that. We're dabbling in it category. All right, so Gandhi, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about why an organization should start thinking about serverless? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so one other thing, let me take a step back and see like how the application's role is changing in the organization in the last 20 years. From the time where an application is just like a utility, like where you know people used to use an application for utility, it is now more of a business function itself. You have applications and apps which which part of the core revenue generation uh, uh, for an any enterprise. So with this in mind. What is more important is you need to have a uh, quick time to market, you have to bring agility, and you need to have the competitive edge where you can bring in the new features and uh, uh, functionalities which the customer wants in the constant market change. That's, way, that's what serverless uh, strategy enables you. Like You need to look at a serverless strategy where you are actually moving away from Dive, moving up from managing a lot of your operation responsibilities to a development. Like more time you are spending on operation responsibilities, you have less time to manage your development of your application or product. That's what serverless strategy is enabling you, like shifting you from doing a lot of uh, uh, you know undifferentiated um, uh, uh, Heavy lifting like you're doing patching, your development tools, your uh, configuration management, your uh, debugging tools, your uh, CSED tools. Yet there are a host of tools which you maintain and manage for a, uh, uh, when as part of the development process. What we are trying to do here is going away from that, have, you know, um, offloading that task to um, the, the, the cloud providers who has got expertise in managing that, and you as a core business function focusing on developing core app product, which would actually truly differentiate you uh, from your competitors. That's what you need to look into the serverless strategy is like how one of the first thing you look into is one of the big advantage you look when you actually move to a strategy is how I'm taking away my operation responsibilities and then focusing on my core development tasks so that I can 
i bring some agility in my product uh, development i bring innovation there's a quick time to market and then i will be able to release new functions and features which are required for my my customers you know more often yeah that makes sense gandhi in fact one of the things that really triggered in my head about why serverless the serverless mentality was a good idea is because so much of the code that we could write is commoditized, right? It's code that's already been built by someone who's really good at it. So why would we reinvest in that? Which is against the, you know, we invented it here kind of mentality that developers love. But, you know, from a business standpoint, you know, really diving into your core value, like you mentioned, seems like the right thing to do. So also, um, Gandhi, what consideration should an organization make when they're moving to serverless? Like, is there any barrier there? What, how do you, how do you look at that? Okay, the moment you move to the serverless, uh, basically the way you function, uh, basically the way you business functions, the way you interact applications changes. As I told uh, previously, like just now, like when you move your uh, lot of, uh, when you're actually offering some of your operation responsibilities to the basic uh, cloud providers, you, the, the overall with serverless, you are adopting like new application architecture, which is more triggered by event. And then you are rethinking how you store your state. You are also thinking about how you operate an application. So, in nutshell, if you see a serverless architecture, looks a lot like a treated architecture which we have been doing all this while. But there are some elements like data, logic, the presentation layer. There are some key differences here. Let's look into the what all the differences which you see in the the basic serverless versus the regular uh, traditional uh, applications so first thing is modularity so when you are looking at there is a single microservice you have a specific uh, function which is designed to do a specific task and then you, and even that function is designed to improve your scalability and resilience Second thing, which is is that the way things work differently is your communication, integration communication. So we are just not using in-process communication between the different functions and methods and procedures. Here we're using a combination of events, messages, and queues that enables the communication within the microservice and API to communicate with services. And third important thing is a purpose-built data strategy. There was a time where we used to have one single database which can do everything. From there, we are moving from rather a single database, you can choose a data store that best fit for a business. For example, in a single um, e-commerce page, you could have uh, 10 different serverless functions. One function could be pulling the data from a catalog, which it might be using a NoSQL database. Another service might be pulling the data from uh, customer preferences maybe from a graph database, other could be user preferences, other could be some doing inventory transactions from a regular relation database. So you could have a different a database, a right tool for a right job. You are using a right database for a right purpose. You are not just using one database which could do everything. And third and most important thing is that, again, I'm coming back to the operation, stressing again, again, is an operation. So in traditional app an application, there's a one release pipeline, you shape it many teams. The process of introduce like bottlenecks, like which is why you know the, the de when we decompose the functional hierarchies, that gives team more autonomy. Like which team has authority to move fast? They can release the new functions continuously without having to wait for other teams. So if I if I look if I uh, put in a, if I summarize this, a serverless technology is actually enabling you to build some of these modern applications. So these are all typical characteristics of a modern application. Even we, we could use the term interesting like microservice or modern application. End of the day, what is more required is you are bringing a modularity, the communication between the, uh, uh, the services is changing, the data strategy is changing, the operation strategy is changing. And then one of the most important thing is that the state an important consideration if you're you know, uh, writing a serverless functions or containers. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, does that resonate with you, Philip and Matt? Um, in terms of <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, you know Mike, our, our journey began um, last year when we were 
developing a, a brand new product. It was an app. Uh, it was going to be device agnostic, so it had to work on Android, Windows, and iOS. Um, and while we were architecting that product, we knew that it had to have a, an integration back to uh, the main application. Um, also, some of the features along with that along with that product or that app um, had to scale behind the scenes. I mean, to, to Gandhi's point, you know, if you look at serverless and what it's really good at doing um, in terms of, you know, taking uh, the headaches of worrying about do I have to right size a server and so forth, um, that's really where it, it resonated with us because we went into the project looking at AWS with services like S3, API Gateway, uh, Elemental Media uh, Converter, SNS, you name it. We knew we were going to leverage those services. But on top of that, we knew that uh, a lot of the back end processing that we were going to build, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, so using technologies like Node.js and Lambdas really resonated with us in terms of what we knew the, the application had to do on the back end to really fulfill what, 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 what we were trying to achieve from a product perspective. So, you know, with that, we knew that uh, once, we, once we understood what Lambda could do for us, it, you know, we were off to the races. There was no turning back for us with respect to serverless and, you know, bridging a lot of those integration gaps uh, with what AWS offers today. Yeah, we, I mean, we really, um, you know, could see all the benefits that Gandhi was talking about. Like you're, you're, you spend the time writing your code, you're not provisioning servers. Um, you know, you do, you know, you don't have to wait for a server to get provisioned. You know, it's all infrastructure as code. Um, you know, it scales with the usage, especially if you're using the serverless, you know, all the serverless um, features within AWS, you're not pay, paying for any idle time. It, you know, it's highly available and fault tolerant kind of built in. I mean, sometimes you need to design that in um, to the way that your, you know, your infrastructure is set up. But for the most part, all the lambdas and, and things like DynamoDB, they, they just come with all of that built in. You don't have to put your effort there. It just kind of comes with that. So, you know, it gives us, you know, you know, our developers each can have their own production environment. It's not like a production like environment. It's a clone of production. And, and so that way they're focusing on the app and not, you know, it, it works on my machine or it worked in dev. Uh, it's the same environment for the whole thing. And uh, those are, you know, we really jumped right in and, and thought that was um, the path for us going forward. Yeah, it definitely gives Just your to, engineers. Uh, oh, go ahead, Gandhi. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Maybe I thought of that. No, I was going to say, you know, to piggyback off of that, it really gives uh, the developers more ownership with what they're developing at the end of the day, which was a big eye opener for us because, you know, traditionally you have, you know, this concept of DevOps and you've got certain roles within your organization. But when you introduce serverless and what you could do with it, and to Matt's point, you know, being able to not worry about calling, you know, your IT brother and saying, hey, can you stand me up a Linux box because I need to deploy my code? Um, you eliminate all that, right? Because now you can own everything from a configuration perspective and do what do what developers really do best, and that is that is write good apps, write good write good uh, write good programs. You know, Andy, did you have something to add there? Yeah, I just add to what, what uh, Matt and Phyllis, what are business. What I see is that you know, um, having you know being worked in a lot of app development for a period of you know last twenty years. One thing which is fascinates me is that. Today, even if any developer wants to develop something, just not development is just not about uh, you writing some piece of code and testing, it, right? You require whole of ecosystem, starting even starting from IDE. Today, without having anything, I can be anywhere else. I can I can launch a cloud nine kind of an IDE in AWS cloud in AWS cloud, which would help me to uh, write my code. It the the IDE integrates with the backend CI/CD pipeline, everything, and then. I could actually uh, write my code. It could be I could invoke it from a uh, REST API using API Gateway. It's all about configuration. I could have an event-based mechanism. I can use Event Bridge where I could actually use an you know uh, one event invoking my API, and then I've got host of monitoring tools, and then uh, my CloudWatch alarms, locks, X-ray tools, and a uh, lot of third-party uh, tools which are available with the click of a button. So that do to to make a production grade production grade api today it takes from months we have reduced that to days literally days right even if i if, even if i'm doing a a small proof of concept demo to one of my customers i i'm sure that the function i wrote can actually uh, is production grade because typically 
the amount of time developer should spend previously is just not about right in the code because we have to make sure that whether it allocate proper uh, you know did, whether i have right size my gvm you know uh, or did i have proper uh, heap being allocated for this function uh, do i have a, a proper uh, caching mechanism is available uh, am i properly logging the logs uh, do i have any monitoring a lot of time goes now now in, now you can write a function i can write say for example simple custom function i want to write i can just develop that function i know that it will scale depending upon my scale goes it can, is reliable it is a production grade application it just you don't have to previously you develop something it has to go through testing you have to do sizing database sizing application sizing memory sizing host of process before you can call this as a production ready i think that way the value of serverless comes serverless is just not about you writing some lambda function right people think serverless means a lambda serverless is just not a lambda because basically serverless is a technology which would take you from all this uh, uh, as i told i'm mean, using the same word like these things what you do they are not truly differentiating you from your competitors uh, what differentiate you is the apis you write the core of your uh, product couldn't agree more and, and i'll piggyback off that real quick so one other thing too you know in terms of the way we were developing this product it also dawned on us that you know to gandhi's point we can do skunk works pocs relatively fast and fail fast and realize real quick uh versus going through that whole traditional uh rigmarole of, of standing up servers getting qa involved getting testing and all this other stuff you can really do quick deployments test kind of your theory of what you want to go develop um, in, in a short amount of time, you know, months uh, versus months versus days, hours, if you will. Yeah. So uh, in the couple of projects I've been involved with, I noticed a couple of things on this point. One is you can deploy with, you know, feeling fairly good about security uh, as long mm -hmm. as you, you know, follow the appropriate best practices as you build out your environment, uh, which are pretty straightforward. And then this, but the second thing that I noticed is that this is a new challenge for developers. They, it's a different way of doing things. You, you can't bring everything together on your one system. And so, you know, there, there is some challenges there. Um, so let me ask you this, Philip, how do you think your teams are doing now that you're pursuing down this path, you know, fast and furious? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's been a great success. So the product I, I, that I mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago, it's out in the wild. It's it's being fully adopted. We're selling it to our clients. Um, we're you know we're, we're it's it's proven to uh, to us you know a, a, from an architecture perspective, security perspective, um, engineering you know the whole gamut that you know we can build really robust products. We can still have traditional integrations back to um, you know let's say the main system that it's that it needs to, to connect with and keep track of all the data and so forth. Um, so for us, it's it's really proven out in the teams. Uh, our teams uh, are definitely drinking the Kool-Aid. They they see the value. Um, they understand that there is a lot of more speed to market availability to them now than they had yesterday, um, and that really resonates with us because you know if you go back to you know tracking velocity and so forth with your teams, when you jump into something like this, um, you see a lot of those quick wins uh, right out of the gate, which is which has been an eye opener for us. Um, and so right now, you know, if you take what the the product we just launched, we're actually building a brand new platform from the ground up. It's a greenfield platform. Um, and you know, rather than having um, you know, some integrations back and forth to kind of this main monolithic system, we're actually doing 100% uh, cloud native and using serverless along the way. Yeah, I mean, our teams, you know, they've, you know, we've been on this journey for uh, a little over a year now. I, you know, and, um, you know, as we get more experience in serverless and just the cloud native development in general, you know, we've we've taken a lot more advantage of automation. We're doing, you know, infrastructure as code across the board. It's enabled us to get into, you know, you know, closer and closer to CIC, CICD. Like you always want to get closer to there, but now we're able to do it um, in an automated way. And, and those are kinds of things that we um you know that were harder for us in our you know in our previous development styles and our previous infrastructures and so we've you know as we've gotten more cloud native we're we're really able to take more advantage of those kinds of things definitely awesome so let's let's move on to um a second poll so jill if you don't mind bringing the poll up 
um, I was just noticing a hawk flying around out my window and it was distracting me. <laughs> that chickens out there and I don't want the hawk to get my chickens. So, <laughs> but I don't need to run out. I think they're going to be fine. Protect those chickens by all means. Um, <laughs> got the, the second poll is up. Yeah. So are there any barriers to your organization op adopting serverless? So what, what types of challenges do you feel you might have, if any? Uh, I'm very interested in hearing people's mm -hmm. thoughts on this. Yeah, because we definitely lived it. <laughs> okay, looks like we have um, everybody who voted who's going to vote. So I'm going to close it. And there are your results. <laughs> All right, so kind of kind of distributed fairly evenly. Um, yeah. A third of the people, no barriers. Um, a third of the people have a series of challenges. Um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think the monolithic application challenge is uh, probably the it's most real. important to overcome because really it requires re-architecting to, to fully mm -hmm. embrace serverless. Although, uh, Philip, if you don't mind, uh, you, you all took a slightly different approach, right? Like you were able to find a piece to carve off and you mind talking about that just briefly? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, when we, we, we looked at this app that we were going to build and, and the, the problems we were trying to solve with the app, you know, it couldn't stand on its own, and we certainly didn't want to build, um, you know, a brand new database for this app uh, just to support the app and then what it what its functions were behind the scenes. We knew we had to have a fully integrated solution back into kind of our core, um, and so we we actually looked at this as, as a kind of a hybrid approach. Um, you know, we're using stuff like React front end um, that's being stored out on S3 buckets. Uh, we're using uh, Node.js uh, on the on the serverless side with lambdas. Um, and then we've got your, your kind of your traditional PHP monolithic app that it communicates with. And so, you know, we were building, you know, REST API endpoints. So that way, when uh, folks are out in the field using the, the app, either offline or online, because it had both capabilities, you know, when that, when that stuff needs to sync up back to uh, kind of the main application, um, we needed to have those integration points there. And then to your point, Mike, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We didn't want to re-architect anything. If anything, we wanted to leverage a lot of that pre-existing tech that we knew we could um, without you know, having to go and tear down certain things or expose um, necessarily new APIs because we already had APIs ready to go. We just re we needed to retweak those to support you know, this new product. Um, and, and I don't know, Matt, you want to provide a little bit yeah, more this, color? Yeah, there? just really, yeah, just really dialing in on that uh, microservice approach. And you know, we didn't want to, you know. You know, we're now on our second journey where we're building a whole new platform, you know, serverless from the ground up, but we knew we couldn't start there and we needed to kind of take, um, you know, something like a, a microservice and be able to kind of test the waters there and get familiar and, and get our foundation in this kind of cloud native development. And, you know, we're expanding from there. Yeah, that's great. So, so in this journey, what are the main challenges you faced? Like we, we listed a few there, you know, monolithic application, et cetera. Uh, what what specific challenges did y'all face and you know how did you overcome those so it, it was interesting you know I, I remember when matt and i were uh in so many of these kind of architectural product reviews uh understanding the scope what what really product vision was and afterwards you know we knew that we were going to be using like like i mentioned before a lot of the aws services um we really didn't have an idea if we were going to use serverless we were interested in it to matt's point microservices was definitely on the forefront of our mind um but it really dawned on us that we don't really know the aws lingo <laughs> uh we know enough to be dangerous we can google just like everybody else on this on this panel can and as well as the folks listening in um but we knew that we had to understand it from more of a technical perspective and really understand what all the services do and how how they play a role so that way when we're you know we're, we're bringing on new team members we can talk the talk and we and let them understand exactly um, what they need to be aware of as well. So, you know, our big thing was we wanted to emphasize on training. Um, and, 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 and with that, let's go get some certification. So uh, Matt and I, <laughs> right after the product started uh, in terms of the development efforts and so forth, it dawned on us, we need to go get certified. Let's, let's understand what it takes to be an AWS cloud practitioner. Um, and let's look beyond that. Let's look for solutions architect. Let's look for DevOps, those sort of things. And not only that, once we do that, that was our opportunity to uh, more or less evangelize to the rest of the engineering group that if we can do it from our level, you can do it, right? And let's start, let's start trickling that down. Let's show the value of all this cool tech we're about to go build and let's 
let's let's get them on a journey from a, um, a career perspective, from a personal development um, to really own and, and understand uh, what it takes to uh, to to work in the AWS world and, and not just Google things, but really understand what it takes to build certain things and integrate to certain uh, components within AWS. And so as a leadership team, Matt and I got certified. And then it was from then with that, uh, I think the light bulbs were going off that we're all in on this. And if you're, you're either on the train or you're off and lo and behold, everybody's on it. And it's, and it's been a, it's been really kind of uh, um, an eye opener for, for, for both Matt and I, and I don't want to speak for you, Matt, but it's been an eye opener for me because um, I would say right now, uh, if someone doesn't have that certification, it's on their quarterly objective to go get it. And I would say right now, uh, my entire engineering uh, group, 98% of the team since we started this last project um, are all AWS certified with some that are already looking for their next certification. So, you know, I think we've done a good job um, communicating how we wanted to evolve as an organization, especially an engineering organization and, and the tech we were wanting to get into. And as part of that, we wanted to make sure we opened up the doors to our engineers uh, from a, from a per career development, personal development, whatever you want to call it, to go and encourage them to get their certs. So that way, when you know they're opening up Jira tickets, they know that confidently, I know how that service works. I know what I need to go be building um, because I've got, I've got kind of that breadth of knowledge uh, and understanding. Yeah, just and it gives us just a common language across the company to be able to, you know, talk intelligently about what what the kind of high level services are. What you know, we're all using the same namespace. It's all the Amazon, you know, namespace uh, for our our terms, um, and it just really gives us that common common language. Um, you know, and that was that was really our kind of our foundation to get started. I think you know some of the learnings that and, and things that we've had to overcome. Um, like you asked, Mike, is you know so many of these you know to really take advantage of all the serverless um, functionalities and, and things that are provided by Amazon. It's you really have to kind of get familiar with an as asynchronous workflow, and you know it you know in our traditional development, almost everything is synchronous, right? You have one you know, and maybe it's even a monolith where it's one one set of code is doing everything and. And to really take advantage of the serverless, you're going to be handing things off. So you're you're starting a job, you're kicking off like a, a workflow with a step functions, or um, you're utilizing SQS or SNS and all these things that are asynchronous. And so for us, it's been a challenge to um, to kind of think asynchronously as well as you know, it's not so hard maybe on the back end, but when you get to the front end, you know, no longer is it instant feedback for the user. You may now have a spinner or a puller or you're utilizing web sockets or different things behind the scenes. And, and it's, you know, we've had to learn how to kind of readjust our UI to, to match that asynchronous workflow of the data behind the scenes. Um, and that, you know, that's been a challenge, but we're, you know, but we're working through that. Um, you know, another area for us that's been a, a challenge to work through or is in the DevOps. So we've always, we had a, a DevOps team and, you know, their focus has been on more of the kind of traditional monitoring and provisioning and, and doing all that. And now that we're infrastructure as code, a lot of that infrastructure code, you know, is, is developed by the developers. So they need to know more about networking and security and all those kinds of things because they're they're writing the code that's building our infrastructure and and then for our devops team you know they're having to get comfortable with developers you know going out and you know being you know working in the areas that they're traditionally stronger in in the security and in the networking and all of that and so kind of learning where devops goes or how it evolves as our teams um you know even like in a dr strategy you know, you know, it, that's changed for us because it's, you know, there are, you know, point in time backups of your databases and those things, but you can design your infrastructures um, to be, you know, fault tolerant and highly available. So the DR is less of a, someone now needs to be woken up in the middle of the night and go handle this task and here's the documented process, but it's, it's, you're building that resilience right into your application and into your infrastructure. And, and that takes everyone, the developers and, and the, the DevOps team and everyone to kind of holistically come together. And so we're learning where those responsibilities lie and, and who's, you know, who can help with what. It's, it's, a, it's been an interesting journey, but we're, you know, we're working through, through those kinds of things. 
Hey, uh, maybe I'll quickly add a couple of just uh, add some other points to the what Matt said. I think one of the important thing when you're uh, starting the serverless journey is to choose the right candidate for your uh, serverless application. Uh, you know, you need to feel like it could be a monolithic application. You might have a lot of bad jobs, or you might have some functions which is having a lot of external integrations. That function is making some ten different API calls, called some different different services. So you need to see like when you're starting any serverless, first pick up the right candidate. Like uh, maybe if you are experimenting something in serverless, pick up something which is uh, not having too much critical business impact. And then at the same time, it, it is not that no nobody is using that function anytime. So you need to be a um, right balance of something which is being uh, used moderately, but it is having less business critical impact when you're starting your journey, just when you're trying something. Second important thing is that don't look from a traditional way of doing a uh, function. Just think like, can I look it differently? For example, uh, I was seeing some one of the customers talking like, you know, just take a simple example. You know, when somebody places an order, you are actually doing the credit check of the customer. You are actually sending email to customer. You are actually sending the order to some back end SAP system. You are doing inventory check. Do you have to do all the things at the same time? There are some things which I can offload to uh, different functions. You know, they can work at their own pace. They doesn't really depending upon like, you know, um, I can still place an order and then uh, leave the task of sending email to different function. I push a message to some queue and then other queue, other service will pick up that message in the queue and then send the email or I can pick up uh, uh, do inventory check through different service for some reasons. Inventory check, uh, inventory, inventory is not there. I need to back order this order. Maybe I can push another message, another queue, which will, another service will actually take the order to back order. Like basically look differently from your, don't try to, uh, you know, uh, model same monolithic in two serverless. Basically mm -hmm. what I, what you do is you're actually moving the problem from, from you know, one place to another place. Then moving from serverless, try to break down the function, see like what you can offload. Something which you're doing synchronously in the past, you are doing it for some reasons, but you can actually do it for asynchronously. The something which you are actually uh, being invoked by API obviously can make it whether can I make it more event based. So look look for I think that you need to uh, you need to do this on a case by case basis. Look at each problem, decompose it, and then look for the areas of where you can actually truly leverage the serverless. And we we definitely you know, learn that as we gone, right? Like we started out very simple and we would, we would try to kind of fit things into the synchronous flow and, you know, have Lambda functions that stay active and do polling. Well, that's not what they're supposed to do, right? You know, they're supposed to kick off a job and wait for another trigger asynchronously down the line to, you know, pick back up that workflow. And so learning how to, how to do those and, you know, we've definitely evolved and we're getting more comfortable in that as we gone and you know we're taking more and more advantages of all the you know serverless um, technologies out there you know once you start to get your foundation and get a little bit more comfortable with handling those asynchronous workflows that's good yeah. stuff maybe uh, maybe i forgot one, one, one more point there sorry maybe I'll interrupt you, but one okay. important point i forgot to add one of the important things when you start serverless is try to pick up the right framework it could be uh, sam uh, lamp framework it could be amplify or it could be some third party framework like a serverless or you know apex this kind of framework so one of the important thing is uh, choose the right framework because when you have the right framework it will come up with the right tools uh, then it makes your life easier when you actually go to serverless journey. definitely mm -hmm. you know and one other thing i wanted to mention too is ser what serverless is not it's not your lift and shift alternative by any stretch if you're going into serverless and looking at aws services and so forth get that lift and shift mindset out because that's not what serverless is good for. It's good for, to Gandhi and Matt's point, it's looking at business logic. What are you trying to solve from a business perspective? Are there things that need to happen behind the scenes that maybe your end user doesn't really care about at that point in time or the application doesn't care about, um, or maybe it does, right? So keeping that on the forefront of your mind when you're thinking about this, don't look at your monolithic app and say, I'm gonna move all this to serverless because that's not the right strategy because we're living it right now. We're definitely a hybrid. Um, organization where we still have a monolithic app that's PHP, um, it's got APIs, it's got you know a robust backend data warehouse, that whole sort of thing. But at the same time, we've got um, you know products and, and apps that are leveraging AWS technology. Some of it's using serverless and so forth. So that's also something I just wanted to share because I know a lot of 
Um, you know, a lot of people in, out in the industry are, are always looking to do this quote unquote lift and shift to AWS and, and, you know, kind of using those terminologies of serverless and this, that, and the other, which doesn't really resonate with us because that doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not, it's not what it's intended for. Finding the right thing that has business importance, but it's just, you know, it's also small enough that, and you can be agile and learn and explore and find your way into there and get familiar with it. Um, you know, just like Gandhi was saying, just you got to find, it's got to be important because it's got to matter. You have to deliver on the solution. Uh, but, you know, that's that was the key for us. Yeah, so listening to um, what Gandhi was saying about the event uh, model transition, it, it's one of the challenges of microservices architectures, regardless of serverless, is this mm -hmm. uh, getting comfortable with consistency eventually. Because that's really what we're talking about is you're not going to be, you know, we're not doing a monolithic relational database where you're ensuring consistency all the time. You have to embrace this idea that some things are going to be out of uh, sync for a short period of time. And you have to design to fill up your point, the, the front end to handle that case, right? To be able mm -hmm. to deal with the fact that maybe you don't have all the orders on the order list yet, or, you know, whatever, whatever that might be. So that's the biggest challenge for me because I come from that relational, cons <laughs> always consistent world. I mean, I've been in this industry for a long time. So the, that's what I'm comfortable with. So, you know, microservices is always, you know, I've struggled with that. Now with the event model stuff, uh, I've always worked with workflows and those and the applications I've built. So this idea of working and event driven is actually quite comfortable for me. So, you know, I do have some challenges and some, <laughs> some benefits <laughs> from my own personal career moving forward. And I'm sure all of us bring something similar. So I wanted to go to an audience question. Uh, give me a second. So Jill, there was someone in the audience that had a question. Do you want to want to run with that one? Yeah, we do. Um, Shrevan, I have unmuted you. If you want to go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear uh, you just uh, fine. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah. I feel like in you know in the past with uh, with servers and um, you know and databases and things, there was a little bit of a structure to what we are managing and uh, how we you know how things work together uh i feel like that visibility of these things working together is starting to you know become a bit hard because um the, there's a lot of lambda functions out there a lot of you know microservices out there um like uh, for in fargate um and it's to, to get a good visual picture of what do we actually have out there to manage is becoming mm -hmm. harder and like who talks to whom and when something is going wrong like how do we debug I, I'm trying to kind of figure out like how do you get hands around it? Just just to give you a background, we are using Lambda, we are using Fargate, we are using S3, RDS, um, but it's still in the early stages. And, and my goal is to actually push it further. But I'm trying to help um, like how do we overcome these initial challenges, uh, both in sort of a design and like really knowing what what's going on, and also on the ma managing side. Uh, so that the teams, you know, uh, like embrace this more and more going forward. That's that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Sure. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I can. I can you know, we all want to jump in, but uh, you know, one of the things that we found is we're definitely spending a lot more time, you know, reviewing diagrams. So we're using uh, Lucid Chart, and we're using um, a tool called uh, CloudCraft. And these, uh, you know, Lucidchart has this great plugin to where I can go out and scan your Amazon account. And if you're, um, you know, if you're using the, you know, the best practices with Amazon is that you're, you know, you're using a multi-account uh, infrastructure. So, you know, you've got that segmentation across, you know, each application or each developer has their own account. Then you can use these tools to have them scan your account and do a drawing, you know, so it'll show you like the infrastructure drawing but we find that we have to definitely break down those flows more. So as we use, um, we're, we're starting to use a lot more step functions or SNS queues, um, SQS, those kinds of things. And we end up documenting the workflow of, you know, this is, you know, it starts here and it triggers this. And then this whole process is happening while we're waiting on the other side asynchronously, you know, with a web socket or with polling or something to, to have these happen. So, we definitely find that we're using Lucid, Lucid Chart or Visio or those kinds of drawing tools um, a lot more. And some of them can also integrate to your Amazon account to 
help kind of discover what you've built and see if it lines up with what you think you're doing. Um, but just, yeah, we're spending a lot, you know, we don't, since we're all working remote, we're not doing this on the whiteboard. We're doing it all like in, in you know, screen shares and, and use of chart and those kinds of tools. And then on top of that, from an operational kind of uh, governance perspective, we've got application performance monitoring tools that plugs right into our Amazon account so that, you know, to Matt's point, we can see it architecturally what's going on. But if we want to see kind of a live, um, real time, what's going on from you know Lambda functions to services integrations uh, and so forth. Um, you know we we've we've in the past have used a handful of tools. We've then we've thus uh, cons consolidated since then and using one kind of uh, monolithic APM tool um, to look at kind of everything that's going on within our accounts um, and uh, a lot of the the services that we're that we're leveraging. So can you tell me what what is, what is the monolithic, uh, what is the tool you're using? It's called New Relic. New yeah, Relic, okay, all right. Maybe just add to what uh, Matt and Philip told. Another important thing is that maybe where you structure your teams with the whole serverless and microservices, the way you look at the teams is all changing to make it more easily manageable. Like you are structuring your APIs, your Lambda, your functions around a specific business functions, then have that this dedicated team who manages that. Uh, just to give you an example, you could have an order uh, API team which manages all orders. You could have some inventory API team. You could have some payments. You could have some catalog. These teams, they manage that service. They are responsible for that. So when you actually divide them, depending upon the need, it could be one of the approaches could you can divide them. But functionally, it becomes easy for you to manage the interaction with the, now you know that, okay, this order team, you know that only thing you have to worry about is what is my endpoint? If, if at all you are having an inventory service, the order service team has to only worry about what is the APS inventory team is exposing to me. You don't have to really worry about all the you know uh, behind the scenes of inventory because you are only communicating through the either API call or through some message. So that yeah. way, you are the way you manage your service becomes easier because you are putting your boundaries like okay this is what my team does this is what order api team does this is the interfaces they're having now your your communication you are thinking only in terms of the api calls or messaging you are not thinking really worrying about what is the data store that is having what is the you know the technology are they writing in node .NET, or java you don't have to really worry about that yeah and matt yeah. i don't know if you wanted to touch on control tower and kind of the way we set up that and, and guardrails and so forth that also kind of lets us know um, from a developer perspective, if we give a developer um, access to set environments and so forth, we, you know, we've got billing that lets us know how much they're doing, when they're doing it, uh, those sort of things to help us understand what's happening within our AWS accounts as a whole. Um, but Matt, I don't know if you wanted to, if that has any relevance yeah. to this, but I think it does. Uh, yeah, I mean, we found like, um, so, you know, one of the, the best practices from Amazon is to, you know, kind of use this you know, multiple account flow. And so we use a, a tool that they provide called Control Tower. And so this gives us like a, a single point of um, entry. We have a single sign-on integration with our, our, our identity provider that we use for all of our single sign-ons. And from within that, we can give easily give members of the dev teams access to their own sandbox accounts within Amazon or within these team shared accounts. Um, it really kind of helps limit the, the blast radius, if you will. Uh, it, you know, if someone did get into one of these accounts, they can only get into that one account, um, you know, for that developer or whatever. But there's, um, you know, within these, we get, you know, access into the, you know, to the budgets and what kind of features they're using. We can put out guardrails, uh, like Philip mentioned, that say, you know, you can only use these regions or these services within your account. Um, you know, we've definitely found those to be helpful. Yeah, so Gandhi, are there any other um, tools that you would suggest that AWS offers to, to help some of these challenges? Um, yeah, we, we have, um, in terms of, uh, uh, we have the, uh, for example, if you're using some framework like Amplify uh, uh, and then SAM that provides you a way to start developing your uh, serverless applications, and um, if 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 the question is more on how do I know like there are a lot of different components involved, how do I know my end to end the debugging everything flow? I think we have tools like X-ray, you know, which would help you to see the 
the how the starting from a from api1 call to how it is goes to the you know till database different function calls you can actually trace them you can measure the time it is taking at each stage so um there are some of the you know uh, tools i could apart from that we are having a lot of third party tools like as uh philip was in your lake or we are having data dog it's kind of third party tools which you can integrate which would give you a good visibility into your uh um uh, the way the your functions uh the whole integration mechanism apart from what we have in the lambda you can use cloudwatch monitoring cloudwatch logs cloudwatch events to uh to, to monitor and then uh see and see what is actually going on in the application awesome thanks candy so jill um do we have another question out there in the audience we do. I have one from Ranthi. Um, let me unmute Ranthi. Can you, maybe his microphone isn't working. Let me um, just read the Yeah, the thanks, question. Jill. Yeah. He says, AWS Lambda is great and it has evolved nicely compared to other cloud platforms. And it also runs now in VPC. Um, he says, I believe it's suitable to event-based use cases and may not fit for those microservices which need to communicate directly to other Microsoft services. Um, and he's, I know AWS Lambda can scale well. However, can it provide some of these microservice patterns such as circuit breaker, cloud slide discovery, et cetera? Uh, those client-side discovery, right? client side yes i can't read very well sorry <laughs> that's all right so we so we do use um we find ourselves using more and more um making use of the step functions so they're like a state machine you know for being able to design a workflow that is a whole series of lambdas right so and and these can have manual steps within them um or they can just be chained up so um you know you if you look into the the step functions you know that is uh you know that's the, that's one of our ways of, of kind of taking these individual lambdas we're still writing the lambdas so that they do one specific thing but then we chain them together in a whole big workflow using step functions and you know sometimes there's sqs or sns involved in there as well but it, it allows you to kind of uh take all those little individual um features or functions and, and, and put them into a bigger workflow and they can handle things like if, you know, if it if it errors or it fails out, how can you catch that and maybe respond in a certain way or roll it back in a, in a way, but um, definitely take a look at the step functions. It, it, it definitely is a, a good way to kind of handle some of those, those things. Yeah, uh, maybe to add to that, um, if the question is more on how to, of lambdas in more of a REST API fashion, uh, fashion. One of the things you should really look into is our API gateway, which is specifically mm -hmm. designed where you can invoke uh, a lambda function through a REST as REST API. Like you could have an API gateway, you could use API gateway for host of things. When one of the powerful services which you can use even for uh, web sockets communication, it is having a built-in authentication mechanism you can integrate your api gate at the cognito pool or you can both or you could have your own custom authorizer or you could have an iam integration and then another important thing is that this api gateways could have multiple ways you could make it an edge base for example you might be having a global application api running in across globally you might want to have an edge optimized like where if people from west coast are accessing they will access the api which is closest to them people from east they will access from east coast like closer or closest to them the ap gateway is one uh, mechanism where you can use it uh, to build this microservices patterns uh, of uh, having a rest based rest rest or http based communication between uh, services another important service where you can look into is aws app mesh so basically app mesh is a service uh, this provides an application level uh, networking uh, you, for example, if you see any modern application as composed of some thousands of hundreds of services, uh, each service is built using you know multiple types of uh, uh, infrastructure. Some of them could be Lambda, some of them could be Fargate, some of them could be on EC2 also, right? So as this number of services pro uh, uh, grows with an application, <coughs> it, <coughs> sorry, it becomes difficult to see like where exactly the location of error, how you are actually uh, rerouting the traffic and everything. So App, App Mesh makes it easy to run these services 
and then uh, provide a consistent visibility and then the network traffic control of all the services. Awesome, thanks, Dan. Uh, so let's go to um, a final poll. And uh, while we're throwing that poll up there, um, I wanted to mention that we do have a handout with uh, suggestions from Gandhi, Matt, and Philip on uh, places you can go to learn more about serverless and uh, resources they use to help them move the ball forward in their serverless projects. Um, Jill, let me know. Yep, I'm going to close the poll right now. I think you're going to like the answers. Zero percent less likely. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we did a good job, guys. Um, uh, look at that. Seventy-five percent more likely. Excellent. I'm glad we were able to help there. Um, so, right. just um, as a final, I'm going to throw this out there as a final question for all three of the panelists. So, any advice, like quick advice, as uh, people are looking for resources or uh, moving forward? Matt, I don't want to steal your thunder because you got you got me get on the serverless stack. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for us, really, it was you know kind of being aware of you know once we kind of learned that what serverless was and what it meant, and it's not just the services, but it's like the mentality. You know, we kind of you know for me, it, it was looking for tutorials and code, and we found one called the serverless stack. It's like serverlessstack.com. It's on the handout, but this is is a really in depth uh tutorial to get you into the serverless uh uses the serverless framework and deploys api gateway and lambdas and a, a react front end that's hosted um serverlessly with uh cloud front and s3 and and so we've you know we've we've used that across our whole company to as a way you know to get into you know get hands-on because that was you know you can go out and get your training and, and get your certification, but until you get hands-on, it doesn't really stick. And so that serverlessstack.com, and then, you know, as you know, you know, there's a number of podcasts out there. There's a really good one called Serverless Chats, um, where they just, um, where they really, you know, every week it's learning about all the new stuff in serverless. Uh, and that, those are some of the things that we use to keep up because it's constantly evolving and changing. And, um, you know, there's, you know, even as we've started things that you couldn't do, you can do now. Um, I mean, it's like every week there's new services or new additions, new features. And so trying to find some resources to keep up on what's available and what's evolving. Um, that's, you know, serverless chats and, and, a, and a, a newsletter called Off by None is uh, have been really good for us. Yeah. And to piggyback that serverless stack tutorial, Matt, both Matt and I took that. And since we took it last year, it's literally evolved as AWS has evolved. Um, you know, going back to that that concept of you know, if you're getting into AWS, you've got to be agile. Well, this serverless stack has evolved in, in such that you know they're using CDK now. They're using a lot newer technologies than when Matt and I took it. And it's one of those things where it's a it's a great resource for your team. And and I would encourage you know as you make investments with your products and so forth, you also have to make an investment with your team. And so, you know, that goes along with supporting them for certifications, supporting them on taking some of these tutorials to really get them to understand versus just paying for, you know, someone to come out and do a, a week long uh, session of what serverless means. Getting this hands on is, is going to be a real, a real eye opener for, for a lot of your engineers uh, looking to get into this. Yeah. And we've really used um, our a solutions architect. That is, you know, we have a, our Amazon account. Uh, you know, we have an account rep and a solutions architect. Um, and we've really made use of them too. We have, you know, regular meetings with them and we ask them a lot of questions and it's typically more around the line, you know, we're, you know, we have this problem and, and they'll, they'll point us in the right direction. And, you know, we've had a really good luck with, um, with a few different solutions architects that are provided by uh, our Amazon team as well. So, you know, we, we, you know, make use of them. They're there for you as well. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, and just to add to that, uh, some of the other resources I can recommend is uh, uh, when you actually uh, want to start serverless journey, uh, we have uh, some of the good serverless workshops uh, which are there in AWS. I have provided the links in the handout. Uh, they're really uh, designed where it gives the end-to-end -end perspective of serverless, and uh, um, and then you, they give very detailed instructions where you can just take them, you can go through them, you can make you know get your hands your hands dirty on the serverless. Another avenue for you to get your uh, serverless is that uh, AWS has got called immersion days where we 
we do this with our partners uh, like like synergy like where we could we can partner with them and then connect a half a day or one day immersion day which deep dive into serverless where you can choose uh, set off your teams who actually want to uh, be in that uh, immersion day you get a hands on experience uh, by doing through it will be mix of your uh, sessions as well as hands on labs by end of the immersion day you would have got a very good idea on what is serverless is all about how we can use this and then maybe you can start experimenting with that third is that we are having a set of specialists in within aws like if you want to um, uh, require a deep expertise on aws uh, serverless it could be api gateway it could be lambda app sync or any other uh, specific thing you want please reach out to us uh, we would provide you all the required uh, guidance and help on maybe reviewing your architectures or uh, uh, providing you um, a, a road a road map or you know a, a direction on how we actually go about solving your uh, challenges and how you can actually uh, effectively migrate from your monolithic world to a serverless. Awesome. Uh, so with that, we're, we're near the end of time, but I want to encourage everyone to reach out um, and connect to Philip, to Matt, to Gandhi. They all have uh, great information. I know there's a lot of questions we weren't able to get to. Uh, we'll happy to answer those after the, the webinar, like say so you can reach out to us directly or um, we will also um, try to compile some answers to the open questions and get those out to you as well. Uh, I want to thank the panelists, uh, Philip, Matt, Gandhi, thank you very much for this very thank engaging you. conversation. Uh, I enjoyed it. I already knew most of what was going on and it still was interesting to me yet again. So uh, I think the audience who mostly has stayed on uh, also felt the same way. So that's, that's awesome. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Everybody.